Ellie Hand and I'm Deputy Director of Research at the Australian Institute of Family Studies. I'd like to start by acknowledging the traditional custodians of the land we are meeting on today, including in Melbourne, the Wurundjeri people of the Kulin Nations, and I pay my respects to all elders, past and present, of the other communities where you are participating today. The Families in Focus Month has been a great opportunity for us to share insights from some of our keynote speakers who would have been presenting at the AIDS 2020 conference. So far, we've heard from Richard Weston, CEO of SNAKE, National Voice for Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander Children, and Mari Brown, Director of well the Child Wellbeing Unit, New Zealand Prime Minister and Cabinet. Today, we have speakers from the Youth Affairs Council Victoria, or YACVIC, as it is known by many, to help us understand how young people are experiencing COVID-19. There is an infographic in the handout section of GoToWebinar that YACVIC has made that highlight the main findings of the survey they've recently undertaken. On to our panel, who have been waiting patiently. Today we have Annika McCaffrey, Catherine Ellis and Fadak Al-Fayed. Annika McCaffrey, um, Annika is an advocate for children and young people who are affected by family violence and disadvantaged by the justice system. Welcome Annika. Catherine, Welcome to you too, is CEO of Yakvik and has over 25 years experience in senior positions across the private, public and not-for-profit sectors, with extensive experience in youth development, policy and practice, organisational leadership and change management and cross-sectorial collaboration. And finally, Fadak. Welcome, Fadak. Fadak is an Australian community lawyer, advocate for gender equality, writer and 15 years ago settled in Victoria as a refugee from Iraq. We're going to hear from each of our panellists first, then we will open to questions from all of you. So please start thinking about what you'd like to ask um, and post your questions in the questions field on the GoToWebinar platform. To help us get through as many of them as we can, please make your questions short, sharp and snappy. I'd like to start with Catherine, if that's okay, and ask you what prompted this that uh, what prompted this webinar was a survey Yakvik recently conducted about young people's experiences of COVID-19. Um, what prompted you to undertake this survey? Thanks, Kelly. It's a pleasure to be here. And I'd like to uh, acknowledge that while I normally live and work on the Wurundjeri lands of the Kulin Nation, today I'm actually on the lands of the Yuin people, um, otherwise known as Batemans Bay. Um, so when the COVID-19 disruption started, it became very clear very quickly to Yakvik that young people were going to be disproportionately affected by it. And so we wanted to make sure that we knew um, directly from young people and from the organisations who work and support, work with and support young people, what was going on for them and what they were anticipating on the horizon. So we did two surveys, uh, one of directly of young people and the other one with um, leaders and, and workers in organisations. And we found with the organisations that they were recording uh, an uptick in demand already, and this was very early in the crisis. Uh, and at the same time, some of them were having to stand down staff, uh, which was a real concern to us. Um, so, but most of them had moved very quickly to put their services online or, or adapt them in some other way uh, and, and have response plans in place, which was fantastic. And what we also found was that they reported very similarly what they were concerned about for young people was what the young people were, were reporting themselves. And so what young people were saying was um, they were very concerned about social disconnection and uh, particularly for teenagers. For emerging adult um, young people, so the sort of 18 to 25 group, uh, the, the biggest concern they had was around uh, employment and income support, unsurprisingly. All of them uh, reported mental health concerns and um, there was also a lot of concern around education disruption. Uh, and in some quarters, uh, concerns around the impacts of increased levels of family violence in the home. And we, also found uh, some things that we were not expecting or, or you know, were, were less obvious, I guess. Um, things like the disabled young people were very um, concerned about how this disruption was going to affect them in terms of their access to workers and their access to workers in schools and, and the, the support they usually receive in education, but also their ability even to leave the home if, if their workers were not able to be with them. Um, and 
young disabled people also um, those on disability support pensions missed out on um, the coronavirus supplement as well that other young people on income support received so there were other things like uh, young people from culturally and linguistically diverse backgrounds um, were having uh, increased stress because they were having to interpret for their families and they were having to help siblings with it, with schoolwork because their parents weren't able to. Um, and in fact, communication generally around COVID-19 was a massive issue for young people because um, I think we were all overwhelmed by how much information was coming down the line from the government on a daily basis. And in fact, Yakvik, we spent a lot of our time in those early weeks and even still now interpreting that information, making it succinct and, and pulling out the bits that are directly relevant to young people. But what was also the problem was that um, the language that was being used and the channels that were being used were not what young people what not conducive to young people actually hearing that information and understanding it so I think that was um, a big learning that that if anything like this happens again we really need to be um, working directly with the government immediately on making sure that young people are hearing the messages um, there were other things like um, LGBTIQA plus young people in lockdown with families who don't accept their sexuality or are not supportive of it. Um, sexual health clinics being closed, so uh, young people, particularly young women, not able to access um, uh, contraception and, and abortion. Um, one that's come out more recently is, is also related to girls, which is uh, because organised sport has been shut down, um, the sort of 14 to 15 year old age group is when a lot of young women drop out of um, sport anyway. And with everything being stopped, there's a huge risk that more young women than normal will, will drop out of sport. And, you know, sport's such an important thing for young women's um, uh, social and, and, and physical health, uh, physical and mental health, but also for their opportunities for leadership and, and um, teamwork and that kind of thing. Um, there was a big concern around technology, particularly for you, young people in rural and regional areas, so access to devices, access to the internet. Uh, and the, the Victorian government actually put in place a, a plan to give devices to any young person who needed it. And that did help some young people, but I don't think it made it to all young people. And certainly it wasn't a national policy. So there were young people all across Australia who were struggled, really struggled to, to do um, education in an online way. Um, and I think um, there were things like also like, you know, young people who have left home and were living independently, either because they needed to go away to university or TAFE, or they needed to move to somewhere else to get a job, or who aren't safe at home for reasons of family violence, or um, as I mentioned before, um, their family's not accepting who they are. And uh, some of those young people, um, they, they weren't considered independent and therefore eligible for income support from the government. And so were surviving with part-time jobs as they studied or as they uh, did other things. And with so many of them lost their jobs because young people, so disproportionately affected by job loss in this crisis um, that they've been forced to move home even though home isn't necessarily safe for them. Um, so I think that and and I think one other point um, that was less obvious was that while there was a lot of money put into mental health support and telehealth um, and that's fantastic and there's been some really good outcomes for a lot of young people because of that. There are also young people who live in environments where they don't have the privacy and the confidentiality to be able to access those services in a way that's safe and, and productive for them. Um, but actually, while I'm just talking about good outcomes, a, a couple of others, there are some young people for whom learning from home by technology has actually really worked for them, either because they are not experiencing bullying at school at the moment, or because um, they're, they're, they're benefiting from being able to pace their own learning. So, you know, I think the education department, certainly in Victoria, is really looking at how do they actually take those gains and those learnings and make sure they don't get lost as things return to uh, whatever's going to be the new normal. Um, and I think um, the other one is that where you have young people who are on job seeker or, or some other kind of income support, where they have been eligible for the coronavirus supplement, they've effectively doubled their financial resources over the last few months. And that has meant for, for some young people, the difference between able, being able to have three meals a day and pay their rent without worrying, um, whereas before they were living below the poverty line. So we're really hoping that as, as 
we go forward and as the government comes up with new policies and we, we take we move out of this crisis that some of those um, good results for young people are maintained at the same time as resources are thrown at addressing the issues that the really really significant issues for young people in terms of mental health and jobs and and disruption to their education Thanks, Catherine. What an incredibly rich set of insights from that survey. Um, and to get that out and back so quickly is, is fabulous. Thank you. Um, Fedak, are these experiences familiar to you? And what have you been for hearing from young people you work with and know? Yeah, uh, absolutely. And thank you um, uh, for sharing some of these insights into the survey. Uh, I'd like to acknowledge that uh, uh, we are where, where I am at the moment in Melbourne um, on Wurundjeri land and pay my respects to mm -hmm. elders past and present um, and Annie who might be watching us today. Um, these experiences are absolutely uh, appropriate to um, to, you know, to summarise what uh, young people have been experiencing. Um, and I do want to uh, specifically start talking about mental health um, amongst migrant and refugee communities. Um, a lot of what uh, 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 the conversations that we're having at the moment around coronavirus, around um, you know our inability to visit family and friends, our inability to travel, um, and being under um, some forms of lockdown, um, uh, you know, across a variety of, rest of restrictions. Um, I've been having conversations with young people from uh, refugee backgrounds specifically, um, and that's heavily impacted their mental health. It's often um, reminded them of times where they were in refugee camps or they were um, in precarious situations where um, they didn't, they weren't able to um, leave their accommodation or leave um, a refugee camp um, for, you know, to visit family or to go to work or, or school or otherwise. So I think that that's specifically a, a triggering and an impactful time um, to refugees' uh, mental health. Um, the other area that I wanted to explore is around how um, uh, we, we often find that uh, people from migrant and refugee communities um, are somewhat overrepresented in essential worker categories. Um, and that's, you know, we've seen that in other countries um, in, in the world where that often impacts these communities uh, a lot sooner or at a larger scale. Um, you know, we've specifically seen this in the US where um, people uh, from you know, African American or Latino backgrounds have been uh, more impacted by the coronavirus. And I think we're starting to see that, um, although there's probably not as much data to, sh to, show, um, to show that, but I, I have been hearing um, anecdotally from community members that uh, because they work in these essential services such as cleaners or um, delivery drivers, um, they are more exposed um, to impacts of, of, of coronavirus and COVID-19, um, which is un uh, unique to people who uh, work in low paying uh, and insecure jobs. Um, I also want to flag that a lot of um, migrant communities, refugees, because they often end up in uh, casual work um, where some of the people who were impacted by uh, job losses uh, very early on. Uh, and, you know, I, I live in an area at the moment where it is one of the hotspots um, in here, here in Melbourne um, in terms of the large number of cases of, of coronavirus. And there is a very diverse community here. So I can only imagine that people are worried about their work. Um, and you know what they would do if they had to um, isolate, and what that would mean for their income and for their family to keep to keep um, you know food food on the table, which is completely um, uh, you know understandable. But obviously, it's not appropriate for um, making sure that. Um, we, we know, we're all safe. And I think at the moment, the, uh, the government's re response um, to supporting uh, cowed communities, to producing um, material in language and to uh, visiting people on the ground, um, I think is a really good idea because that way we can reach people who might not have access to the um, amount of news or information that we all do um, and to get the accurate and appropriate 
um, uh, communication, such as you know, to stay home if you're sick, even if you even um, if they're very mild symptoms, and to get tested and to um, or, or the coughing etiquettes. A lot of that information can be missed if you're not an English speaker, um, and I think the responses at the moment is quite quite valid. Okay, thank you, Feta. Annika, you've started a bit of a campaign around support for young people experiencing uh, domestic violence. Can you tell us about where this idea came from and why it was needed during the pandemic? Yeah, so um, my campaign is called The Hidden Victors, which is an online YouTube video that stars young victors of family violence. And by victor, I mean a young person who has a lived experience of family violence. I just wanted to point out that the reason why they're called victors is because they all have a history of victory. So how it all started was when I was working for YAPVIC under the Young Thinker in Residence program, which is a program for young people to think on a social or political topic issue of their choosing and develop a project. So my project was primarily focused on family violence and the impact it has on children and young people, a social justice issue that I've reflected on and used from my own personal lived experience of family violence. Throughout my lived experience, I didn't get the help that I needed growing up. As a young person, you rely heavily on and should be able to trust teachers for, from your school, for example, child protection workers and the police, but they were the people that made me mistrust the, the justice system the most while I was going through family violence. My experience made me feel powerless and hopeless. And that's exactly what The Hidden Victors is about. It's the opposite to that. It is about addressing only a few issues mentioned by the young people in the video to the system and giving other young people who may be going through family violence personal messages of hope. And this is absolutely crucial that the message is needed, especially throughout this difficult time to know that they aren't alone and that their voice matters. It is being reported currently that cases of family violence are more higher during COVID-19 due to restrictions and having to self-isolate. I will point out, however, that family violence is still present no matter what. Young people's experience of family violence is often overlooked and not considered by police members and workers in the sector. Young people are more vulnerable because many don't know what safety plans are in place or how to, ha how to act on them because they haven't been able to be in the making of them. There has been little consideration of what children, young people and family violence need during lockdown. And this has been the same since before COVID-19. What could policymakers and practitioners in the courts um, do to better support young people uh, experiencing family violence? Um, firstly, children, young people's experience should be heard to help inform policy and practice. We have insights that no other person or textbook or research has. There should be resources such as screening and assessment tools developed to help children, to help ch teachers, police, youth workers and DHHS workers to engage with children and young people with lived experiences of family violence better. Children and young people's experiences should be supported and taken seriously. Children and young people should be involved in safety planning because at the end of the day, they are the ones that knows what makes them feel safe at night. They are the experts. And overall, children and young people's voices need to be part of the conversation. Thank you. Fadak, have you been hearing similar themes in, in your community work um, around family violence? Uh, absolutely. I think um, I do agree with Annika that yeah. it's really distressing to hear of stories where uh, you know, women, children have to um, often be isolated with uh, a family member who who has who is also a perpetrator of family violence, and that's. Um, uh, uh, I mean, there are a lot of stories that were coming out uh, in uh, specific diverse areas around Melbourne where uh, uh, we uh, we were seeing more cases um, of family violence amongst diverse communities, um, and I think you know not, I think it's across the board that it's a, a stressful time, um, and that often 
heightens um, the risk of, of violence against women and family violence. Um, although there is, you know, all, everybody goes through stress and there's absolutely no excuse for violence um, when, when, when someone is stressed. Um, that's, that's not, I don't think that's the reason in, in driving violence, but it does um, add to um, the factors um, that, uh, that enable violence against women. Um, and I just want to uh, 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 talk a little bit more about what uh, young people from refugee and migrant background, backgrounds are, are going through. I mean, um, as, as Catherine mentioned, uh, young people have been uh, heavily impacted by the disruptions, including uh, uh, loss of employment and um, impacts to uh, ed education. Um, however, um, something that I have been seeing that's been really quite uh, positive uh, is that I've been hearing of stories of, of people saying to me or, or um, mentioning that they, uh, the wider community finally can um, uh, sort of empathise with some of what the refugee communities and migrant communities go through, um, you know, specifically around um, the isolation that we find ourselves selves in at the moment, um, the needing or the, the feeling of um, fear. Uh, you know, I, I often think about, you know, in early March when we all started preparing for um, lockdown and there was, you know, a, lot of, a rush to the shops to get as many supplies as possible. Um, you know, the, these kinds of uh, situations have made people think about um, what it is like to be a refugee or to be someone who's going through um, you know, a, a massive global uh, event um, that's uh, putting a lot of stress uh, on them and, and their families. And I've, you know, in conversations of Refugee Week was, was only last week. And, you know, I had a few talks where um, people in the end, they said, you know, we can finally empathise with the refugee experience because we feel like we've gone through something very uh, similar um, at the moment during the COVID-19 times where there, where there is so much uncertainty uh, and a lot of um, uh, cautiousness and, and, and a little bit of fear about the, um, the unknown, uh, which is something that refugee communities go through um, absolutely every day. So for me, if there is one positive outcome, it, it has been that, and it's been touching to hear that there is empathy across the community as well. Mm. Yeah, thanks for that. I think um, while there are many people who experience vulnerabilities in Australia every day, there's a group of people who've experienced that perhaps for the first time with such intensity through the pandemic. Mm. And um, that perhaps maybe has led to a shift in, in perspectives. It was a very unsettling time for us all. That's for sure. Yeah, I had a question um, which I'd be interested in, in each of you giving me a bit of a response to, is that in our own survey, um, we found that dis um, young people felt more lonely and disconnected than older people um, in general. And this was a bit of a surprise to us because I think there was this sense early on that um, because young people are much more engaged with the digital world and social media and, and you know, probably experts at Zoom even before we started um, the pandemic, I think there was an assumption that they would be able to stay more connected and so I'm interested in your thoughts because that doesn't seem to be how it's panned out. People talk about being much more lonely. Yeah, I, I was actually surprised when we received that response in our, our survey as well. Uh, but then when I thought, because I, you know, we're, we're talking about digital natives, young people who have never known anything but having 24 seven access to friends via the internet. But um, then I thought about it and, and I actually think it's a really good lesson to us that young people do get an enormous amount of their social connection through school, through sport, through community activities, through volunteering. Um, and when all of that is taken away and the only thing that is left is the internet, actually it, it is a huge deficit in their lives. And in actual fact, I think it's a good learning for us in terms of how do we rebuild our community and how do we um, look at where people are lonely and invest in face-to-face -face community activities where young people can actually be drawn into those and supported to participate in them if it's not something that comes naturally. So, you know, it, it could be a very, very positive outcome out of this whole um, process, as well as the ability to deal with uncertainty, which um, Fadak was mentioning. I'm, I'm a Gen X 
and I know that my generation was defined by the 1990s recession when so many of us couldn't get jobs and we didn't know, you know, when, when the economy was going to come back and it, it doesn't even compare to what's happening now but I know that that was, you know, that's where Gen X was de defined and I think this generation of young people are going to be, um, I, I think we'll have a level of resilience that, you know, is probably unheard of, unprecedented to use that word that we've heard so much of um, going forward. And part of that will be looking at these hybrid models around um, digital combined with face-to-face -face and the recognition that the human connection is a huge part of our lives. Mm -hmm. And just adding to what you're saying, Catherine, I think it's um, a fantastic reflection to think about what, what can, how can we support young people in, in the future um, and take this time to reflect on some of that face to face um, uh, connection and activities. And I mean, going back to some of the results that you discussed and, and seeing that the intersectionality of disadvantage can impact some young people more than others. Um, and I think there needs to be a, an investment in um, supporting um, the variety of diversity that that young people are, um, you know, whether it's uh, you know uh, from being a, from a cultural or linguistic or uh, religious background, but also um, in terms of gender and sexuality, um, and just ensuring that there are um, a variety of safe safe spaces for young people to meet uh, with like-minded. Um, you know, other like-minded people and to have access to safe spaces where they can connect with others just like them. Mm -hmm. And actually one group we haven't talked about, and I was remiss of me to, to not mention it earlier when I was talking through different um, impacts, Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander young people have been very seriously affected by COVID-19, partly mm -hmm. in terms of the additional um, risk to Aboriginal uh, communities where particularly if people have um, health issues that, that mean that they're more susceptible to the virus itself, but also in terms of the cultural restrictions that were created by the COVID-19 lockdown where uh, young people couldn't ha have access to elders, couldn't have access to their community through um, when sorry business happened at funerals and things. And um, so there's, and then on, on top of that, of course, the Black Lives Matter movement has become has has blown up enormously, which is very positive in a lot of ways, but actually has also put an, an enormous um, emotional strain on Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander young people through this whole period when it was already heightened for them. So I feel like um, part of uh, of actually evolving from this this crisis is also going to be really listening to Aboriginal communities about what they need for their young people and how the rest of us can support that um, being put into place quickly and, and effectively. Yeah, thanks Catherine. Um, we have a question from the audience which I might um, put to you all. Um, does the panel believe that the rights of youth are slowly being eroded away whilst in the time of COVID? And does the panel also believe that young people will get our rights back when it is all over? Um, Patek, would you like to start with that one? Ooh, um, sure. Um, rights eroded. Um, um, look, I think that we are going through a lot of change at the moment, and I think that they are telling times, they are challenging times. Um, and I hope that it's a time where we can reflect on how we can be better. And I think we've already come up with some suggestions so far in the panel as to you know, using this as a time for us to reflect as a community um, or, or from, you know, a policymaker's perspective, reflect on what um, could be uh, improved. Um, I think that, you know, we've seen, um, you know, like the uh, 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 Centrelink payments being increased and, you know, free childcare and um, some of these initiatives that have really um, gone a long way to support um, people in, in need and people who have been directly impacted. So I think that uh, to, to an extent we have, we've taken this time as an opportunity to step out of the, the, the norm and, and, and support um, support people in the community who need it. Uh, but I think there's a long way to go and I think that um, we absolutely need to use this as a time to reflect and as a time where, uh, as a time where we can learn as to you know what could we what's missing and what can we do better um, and specifically to support those vulnerable um, and I go back to the intersectionality um, point because you know some young people are more impacted than others and I think we need to um, 
take a unique look as to how we can support support them specifically um, as well as young people more generally. Yeah, moving forward, I mean, it, I guess like using this time to reflect um, and also using this time to also like move forward now that we've experienced this, you know, what is it in the future that's going to make positive change and positive impact? Um, and I, to be honest, I'm just, I'm just thinking that it's just, it's something so, something that we could have done a long time ago, something that should have been implemented a long time ago, but now that we've been forced to kind of reflect during this time, I reckon we should use it as a positive to move forward. Um, I'm not too sure what that, that's mm -hmm. going to look like, but I'm hoping that it's going to be a positive impact upon everyone, upon our communities, upon our young people. Yeah, I think um, in terms of rights of young people, it's something that we always need to be um, keep in mind and, and keep an eye on because there are there are uh, ways that young people's rights can be quite insidiously undermined and we and this, you know, they also say never waste a crisis and at this moment the country can go in a number of different directions based on what's been happening and and what are the sort of ideologies of different governments and um and what the population wants as well and there's a real risk that young people will be the scapegoats of this crisis and uh, history shows after the GFC and after the 90s recession, young people were hit the hardest and they were the last ones in the, the, to recover and the, the ones that took the longest to recover in terms of employment. And this time it's also education and mental health and all kinds of other things as well. So um, uh, Danielle Wood, who's the incoming CEO at the Grattan Institute, a few weeks ago on, on Q&A was talking about the fact that uh, if we're all in this together, um, it's not right that young people having already sacrificed in terms of losing their social life at a time when um, you know peers and, and exerting independence is such a huge part of development and, and having their education disrupted and losing their jobs should also be then asked to bear the burden of the recovery in terms of a massive debt for the future that, that, that they will have to pay off and cuts to social services and welfare services and education. And we've already seen you know, this week, there's a, a real risk that some of the university courses are going to be made more expensive so we, we need to be making sure that, that young people are not paying the price twice. Um, and we have a tax system that's very, very biased towards older people. And so maybe if we're all in it together, now is the time that we really seriously need to be looking at that. We also potentially need to be asking business leaders um, to be, to be t and willing to take a cut at their, on their bottom line in order to fund entry level jobs for young people and to perhaps pay a bigger, um, make a bigger contribution to the tax base of the country in order to be able to um, fund the things that young people are going to need over the next 10 years to really come out of this crisis without the sort of long term um, intergeneration, uh, sorry, generational scarring that's a real risk. Yeah, thank you. Annika, back to you. Um, when children are subjected, who are subjected to abuse reach out, um, we have a question about why exactly do you think the system is unable to take decisive steps quickly? Um, I guess I'm not too sure why exactly that's the case, but just from reflecting on my own personal experience and um, from other young people's experience that I've interacted with, um, it's something that they're just not involved in and when they're not involved in the decision making um it reflects and impacts on them twice as harder because their people are making decisions on their behalf that they're unaware of and that they may not feel safe about they may not feel comfortable about um and it just it just leaves them in this uncomfortable position like what if this is really going to be the best um best thing for me so that's yeah that if, I'm not too sure if that answers the question but yeah that's all I can thank you say. Yeah. well as, as you said I mean it's it's more about understanding from your experience what's happening and I think you know that's really important for us in this this panel today um how about um young people's employment generally and you know 
tend to be more casual, part-time, insecure employment. How do we think that's going to be um, impacted on going forward from, from this point on since the pandemic? Is there any indication from the survey, Catherine? Well, we did the survey very early on, so um, and, and it wasn't looking at solutions, it was just looking at what was going on for young people. But already at that point, we knew that there was a, a big impact on young people's jobs for a couple of reasons. One is that the industries that were hit hard and hit early were the ones where that, that employ an enormous number of young people. So hospitality, the arts, tourism, and they're also the industries where a lot of young people get their first foot on, a, on the job ladder and get that experience that allows them to go on and get more jobs afterwards. Um, and the second reason is that a lot of those jobs are casualised. And if a young person hadn't been in the casual job for a year, then they weren't entitled to JobKeeper either. So uh, there was a, a double whammy there as well. And so, and, and you know, some of those industries will come back. Um, some of them will come back fully, some of them won't come back at all. And there's probably something in the middle of there, there too. So, uh, and at the same, and as young people are looking for jobs, they're going to be competing with young people coming through after them. And they're also going to be competing with older people with more experience who are also looking for jobs. So uh, it's, it's a pretty um, concerning outlook. And it, it, in actual fact, that one of the solutions needs to be that governments at federal and state and local levels are looking at how can they actually invest in stimulus packages that are pro-youth. So how can they actively create jobs that will specifically give opportunities to young people? Whether it's to get a first step on the ladder of, of getting job work experience or whether it's about a long-term career, um, without that proactivity, it's going to be very difficult for many young people to ever get into the into the workplace. Hmm. Yeah. Fata Karanika, did you, either of you have anything to add to that question in terms of your own um, context? Hmm. Oh, only a little bit. I think um, I, it makes this question makes me reflect on um, some of the data that came out to say that. Uh, women and young people were disproportionately more impacted um, by uh, job losses and specifically um, around you know, since, since, since March. Um, and it does make me think that, it, you know, it, we're at a time where we can, um, as a nation, make a decision to support people who have been left behind. Um, and sadly, that it is um, uh, disadvantaged uh, people and communities um, and, and groups that that are often end up in um, uh, insecure work and as a result um, uh, and like like Catherine said uh, sometimes in industries that have um, were, the, were some of the first to be impacted by um, by the crisis so I think that it, it is it is um, a time where we can decide where, where to go next and uh, definitely a critical time for us as a community I think um, staying with the theme of the future, I'd be interested in um, for each of you in the work that you do, um, whether the, what feedback you're getting from young people about how they are feeling about the future at this time. Um, Catherine, can I start with you? Um, well, I think young people are very keen to be part of the solutions and play a role in the rebuilding of the country. And that's a very, very positive thing and very in line with you know, good practice in, in youth participation and youth voice. And you know, I think if, if we don't, we, we must take advantage of that. We must actually say this is the time, if ever, that young people are able to step up and be at the centre of, of development and centre of um, thinking about and reimagining of, of how this country needs to be. And that includes all young people, young people from all kinds of backgrounds. And to Fadak's point, young people whose voices are often not heard because they're part of communities that um, can, can face marginalisation, particularly when it comes to decisions being made. So I think it's very positive that young people are ready and you know I work with them every day and they're amazing and I don't think a lot of decision makers actually have that experience and understand how fantastic young people can be if they have a platform and the resources and the encouragement and the doors are opened. So we all need to be actually looking at how can we at any point where there are decisions being made about COVID-19 recovery and actually bushfire recovery too, because we can't forget the bushfire communities. So it was so devastated less than six months ago. And um, all, you know, it's all part of the recovery process now and the rebuilding and the reimagining. And we hear a lot about build back better. 
And without young people's voices, how could we possibly do that? Young people have the biggest stake in the future. They have the most skin in the game right now. They are creative. They think out of left field. I mean, I would love to have a philanthropist or a government step forward and say, we want to pay young people in every community to actually go and talk to business leaders, community leaders, and identify opportunities in their community that can be invested in, that will create jobs, that will real, rebuild community. I mean, what a wonderful outcome that would be from this crisis. Mm, yes, yeah, I can see that, Catherine. Uh, Annika, I'd be interested in your answer to that question, but to add to it, um, what are meaningful ways that young people could be then engaged to contribute to developing Australia's future? Um, definitely to trust to, because I, I, I'm a youth worker, I work with um, uh, little kids, um, to just listen to their creative ideas. Well, like what, especially about this time, the amount of imaginative creative ideas that they have to do um, to do at home and what they create and what they come up with is just amazing. Just to, um, to get them um, busy and to get them um, energetic, just to get them up and you know even out of the place just for a walk in the park around just just all those kind of things and just moving forward i think they will be using what they've learnt throughout this time in that and even um pushing for some ideas if they're talking to their teachers and schools um just some creative ways to um if if this was to happen if, if this was to drag along or if this was if this crisis was to happen again to um, incorporate those ideas and listen to them because they they have minds that you know we, we don't think like them and like the amount of creativity that comes out of them is just amazing so I think that's I think it's really important. Could I just add to what Annika said then in terms of the school environment one of the sort of potential outcomes of this whole crisis is that there's going to be a lot of young people whose education was disrupted and they don't catch up again. And so actually investing in schools and teachers and um, teacher aides and youth workers in schools to help this generation catch up and keep up um, will be a really important part of coming out of this. Uh, and, and really taking young people seriously, as Annika said, in, in terms of their ability to uh, make recommendations and play a role in how their school should function and, and how it should go forward as well because um, they know they know what's going to work for them they know what's going to work for their peers um, I was talking to a young person recently who said that he, we were talking about how there's a lot of young people at risk of um, dropping out of school because they haven't really coped with working online and um, they maybe were on the edge anyway and how do you entice them back into school and this young person was saying well they've all missed the social side of school. So what we should be doing is actually emphasising the social side of school, having welcome back events and, and things that actually entice young people back for the social connection, and then they can be supported to catch up on the, on the academic work. Great, thank you. Fadak, did you have anything to add around engaging young people and their hopes for the future? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, um, I'm just reflecting on some of the comments that I heard uh, only last week from young people during Refugee Week. And one of the things that, um, you know, I was asked is, and, you know, how do we get through this uncertain time? And the the the, the biggest thing I, I, I was able to reflect on was back to my refugee experience um, 16 years ago, when the, the thing that got me going um, is hope. And, you know, my advice to people, young people otherwise is uh, unless we have hope um, that things will get better in the future and um, that we will be able to go back to a new normal, um, that then that, that's that's a big thing that's going to uh, enable us to keep going, especially um, in, kind of in terms of supporting uh, uh, each other and ourselves with our mental health and um, ensuring that, um, you know, you know we, we keep a positive outlook. I mean, I don't know what would have gotten me through um, my experience experience if it wasn't um, some degree of hope that things will get better for me and my for, for my family. Um, I am also hope, hopeful um, because going back to what I said earlier in terms of 
there is a lot more empathy and there is a lot more kindness that I'm seeing uh, towards refugee and migrant communities at the moment um, where people are able to reflect about the challenges and the difficulties that these families go through, whether it be the decision to leave a country um, overnight and to flee and to seek um, safety elsewhere um, because something so big um, and so much bigger than you that you can't control has happened. Um, and I think we are at a time where I feel very hopeful that um, a lot more empathy is being shown towards people who seek asylum um, and I, I, I feel really um, uh, pleased to see that people are able to reflect on that um, and to empathise with others when we are going through such a difficult time. Um, and my last point around the future is that we need each other to get through this and yes we are separated and yes we are um, we're not uh, socialising as we used to, um, but we still need each other. And just because we have physical distancing doesn't mean we ha should have social distancing, um, you know, in terms of, you know, talking to each other, whether it be online or, you know, um, uh, in person um, under the guidelines. Um, but I think that's the other thing that's going to get us through this difficult time and, and a vital one for our community is that we need each other to get through this. Thanks. Thanks. And that's an excellent point, I think, to um, wind up the conversation we've been having today. Um, so thank you. And uh, I mean, it's been brilliant to be able to speak with the three of you and, and hear your insights about, I think, what is an issue we will be talking about a lot for a long time to come, I think, in terms of the impacts on young people and our needs to support them. Um, for the audience, as the exit the webinar, there's a brief survey that's going to appear and we'd love it if we could hear your insights insights on how we've gone today and what you'd like to hear from us in the future. Um, and I'd just also like to remind people that this webinar was actually going to happen at our conference this year in 2020, but unfortunately, because we are not allowed to physically be together right now, we've gone to a, um, a, a webinar format, but we are going to hopefully have our conference, or we are going to have our conference in June 2021, and registrations are now open, so please have a look and um, head to our website to find out more um, and register and join us for then. Um, and also, I'd just like to promote um, some more webinars that are coming up in our Families in Focus series. So later this week on the 25th of June, we have our fourth webinar, which is featuring Angela Lynch, who's discussing, discussing COVID-19 and its impacts on the family violence legal and service system. On the 30th of June, we have Jay Weatherill talking about a new early childhood system in Australia. Don't miss out on those. Um, and further details of all our June webinars can be found on our website. But before we finish up, I'd like to thank again um, our presenters today. It's been fabulous talking to you and getting to know you virtually. I'm looking forward to meeting you all in person uh, in the future. So thank you, Catherine Ellis from Yakvik and Annika McCaffrey and Fedak Al-Fayyad. It was a really rich and important discussion and I really appreciate your time today. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you.